Hello, and welcome to worship on this first Sunday in June. My name is Bonnie Taylor, and I'm the pastor of Faith United and West Sunbury Presbyterian Churches. In the midst of a world in chaos, we come to the Lord to find peace. When our minds are overwhelmed with what we see, we come to the Lord and find hope. If our hearts are heavy with fear, with worry, with sorrow, we come to the Lord and find strength. As we long for community in a world that's torn apart, we come to the Lord and find love. People of the living God, let's come together in this moment and find peace, hope, strength, and love as we worship and pray together. Please join me now for our prayer for illumination. Let's pray. O oh God, source of all light, by your word you give light to our souls. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open to you. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes to us from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13. Hear God's word. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This has been a painful two weeks in America. As I consider our lectionary text, I can't help but see it through the sorrow, grief, 
and anger that's playing out as thousands of people take to the streets across the U.S. and around the world. Although I was only in elementary school, I remember the Watts riots, police actions, assassinations, and burning cities in the 1960s, as well as the peaceful demonstrations that accompanied them. When I say I remember them, I experienced none of them firsthand. I remember the images that I saw on television, what I read in the newspaper, and the opinions I heard expressed by family and friends. Like most white rural suburban Americans, my family watched and judged from a sanitized emotional and physical distance. No one we loved experienced police brutality and we knew no one who marched in the protests. And we were sure that there was something wrong with them because everything was just fine in our little white farming town of Puyallup, Washington. We didn't experience ourselves as racist because there weren't any African Americans living in our community for us to discriminate against. Sure, we had our biases just like everyone else and we told some racial jokes, but that's not really racism. It was all in good fun. At least that's what we told ourselves. We were just committed to taking care of our own, staying out of other people's business, and expected the rest of the world to do the same. At best, we saw ourselves as neutral. At worst, indifferent. 60 years later, we're back in the same painful, disgraceful place. And why shouldn't we be with the majority of Americans today, just like my childhood community of the past, in denial about the inequities that exists in our home of the brave and land of the free. As I read scripture, I have to honestly ask myself, what's my part in all this injustice and unrest? I'm not the little white girl living in Puyallup anymore. I'm a grown woman of faith who cherishes the body of Christ with all of its diversity and a country based on justice and equality for all. What's my part in our country falling short of being the best that it can be for everyone? What's my responsibility as a child of God? And what's our duty as the body of Christ to, as the Apostle Paul says, put things in order? Or as other Bible translations put it, how do we strive for full restoration and live in peace. One place to begin is to take hope in the fact that our past doesn't have to determine our future. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I had the understanding of a child. But when I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Words from 1 Corinthians 13. For me, leaving childish things behind means making a searching and fearless moral inventory of myself. Many will recognize this as step four in the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That inventory causes me to confess that as a white American growing up in a white community, I was immersed in white exceptionalism from the day I was born and that that in itself produces racism. My family was poor and we lived on the wrong side of the tracks, but still felt superior in the fact that at least we weren't black. That attitude is an errant racist thread that's been woven into the fabric of my life and to deny it is to blind myself to the sinful influence it seeks to exert on my every action. I invite you to join me, to honestly and prayerfully consider your own life story in light of your personal experience of the America, community, and family you grew up in. What's the Spirit calling you to do to put things right that we might live in peace? It will take every one of us acknowledging the truth that racism exists and influences us all then humbly repenting, turning in a new direction and engaging in actions that bring about healing and wholeness in the body of Christ and in our country. 
Until we as individuals embrace the change that needs to happen within each one of us, there will be no real lasting peace or justice for any of us. I'm grateful that by the grace of God, we're forgiven and restored day by day, truth by truth, as the Holy Spirit vigilantly works to conform us to the image of our loving Christ. Striving for full restoration also means hearing each other's stories, both our stories of confession and repentance and the life experience of our brothers and sisters of color. This past week, I received a letter from a fellow Presbyterian, Ralph Lowe. It's addressed to Dear White Siblings in Christ and describes one man's life experience, a glimpse into the world alien from my own, but one I want to understand. Another news cycle, another life, black life taken, and another city in rage and in flames. I'm tired, I'm angry, I'm scared, I'm outraged, I'm desperate, I'm hurt, and I am black. I'm the director of Justice Ministries, husband, father, coach, brother, best friend, student, and I am black. Again and again in America, it's clear that the last adjective is the only part that determines my worth. I am Brianna Taylor, Antoine Rose, Armand Arbery, Eric Garner, George Floyd, and Ralph Lowe. As a father of four American young men, I have constant conversations with them about living while Black. We talk about how to effectively comply when pulled over or stopped on the street by the police. Make sure your hands are always visible. Always announce your actions. I'm reaching for my wallet. I'm opening the glove compartment for my insurance. This conversation is framed by the false narrative of black men and women whose non-compliance resulted in death. How do we explain the evil to our children of the George Floyd murder. I chose not to use the word violence because violence seems balanced, fair or justified, and what we have seen recently is none of these. I educate my sons to speak truth always, but it's heartbreaking to speak the truth when it means looking into my beautiful young teenage boy's eyes and declaring the reality that the world says their black lives do not matter. Neither Chris nor I ever had to have a conversation like this with our kids. We never had to warn them about what might happen at a routine traffic stop if they made the wrong move or said the wrong things. I've never felt bullied by the police, not even in major cities. For me, the police has always been a positive presence, there to help, to assist, and watch over our best interests. What's it like to live in a world where a police officer can be your enemy, a threat to your life? I don't know that world, but I believe it exists. I believe black, my, I believe black lives do matter and that they matter to the vast majority of the people in our country. But I can understand why it might not feel that way. It's like the rioters amid the protesters. The actions of a few can color the perceptions of the whole. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think it's the whole world that believes that black lives don't matter. I think it's a much smaller segment of this country that continues to place its knees upon the necks of those who are different. A minority that continues to believe that racism is acceptable before God, before others, and before the nation. It's time for the majority to stand up and say, it is not. Ralph Lloyd's letter, Ralph Lowe's letter continues. The arrest of Minnesota police officer Derek Chauvin doesn't correct the issue of racism. The, race, the issue is systemic and historical, 
Regardless of race, we are affected by the realities of this societal injustice. We're all affected by this injustice and we're all responsible to correct it. Thank you for changing your Facebook profile or liking a post, but more is needed. The Holy Spirit calls us to embody justice. The book you read on white guilt is a good start, but the Holy Spirit calls us to action. Praying for these issues is not enough. The Holy Spirit calls us to be doers of the word, not merely hearers. If you faithfully say Black Lives Matter, you mustn't get involved with Black life. Assume racism is everywhere, every day. Support the leadership of people of color. Talk to your children about racism. Understand and learn the history of racism and how it is, has evolved over time. I'm grateful that Ralph Lowe hasn't given up on us, that he took the risk to speak the truth in love to those of us who are his white Presbyterian brothers and sisters, that he invites us to build a real community with Christians of color, and that he points the way by suggesting specific actions. Now it's up to us. What will we do to put things in order and live in peace? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, let's pray. Holy Father, we confess that we have been reluctant to speak out clearly. We've neither named the injustice we see nor declared your vision for peace. Before you and one another, we confess our reluctance to receive our calling as God's people, made by our creator and chosen as witnesses to your dream of justice and joy. Remind us, Holy Spirit, that you've made us for your service and recharge us with the power of your word. Renew us, O God, and grant us courage to live out your way of peace and grace. We ask this in the name of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen.